Welcome to episode 58 of the Liberty Dad podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. If you're new to the show, Liberty represents the message of all your freedom all the time. And dad represents the delivery, recognizing that my conversation or tomorrow's conversation with my son is determined by how I engage with him today. And then applying that to those around me. I'm your host, DL, and I'm once again joined with Josh from the Libertarian Apothecary. And this episode is Bills, 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 where we're going to spend the entire episode catching up on some bill reviews. For one reason or another, I opted to skip the bill review in previous episodes, and I wanted to catch up on them. And as you know, if you pay attention, there is never scarcity of bills to review. So my first question was wondering whether or not we would be able to pull this off. I wondered if I could pull it off in my monologue episode, and now we're going to attempt and pull it off in the discussion episode with Josh and I. So we're going to see if we can do this without putting people to sleep. So let's see how it goes. Josh, hello, good day, sir, and how are you? Hello, DL. I'm doing uh, doing pretty well. L- little under the weather with a cold, but um. I'm doing okay, you know. Gotcha. Small things. I hear you. So today we're going to be reviewing three bills. We're going to be reviewing Florida HB1. That's the Combating Public Disorder Bill. Florida HB 1475. It's titled the Fairness in Women's Sports Act. And then United States Senate Bill 937, titled the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act. Now, of these three, Florida HB one actually was signed into uh, was signed into law by Governor DeSantis. I believe that fourteen seventy five has been tabled for this session. I think it did receive a bit of backlash. I'm not entirely certain exactly of its particular situation. And then nine three seven, I believe, is still kind of in progress. It's kind of like hanging in there. I haven't checked recently to see what its particular status was. So, Josh, you got any immediate thoughts on the HB1 bill? Because we got to fight some public disorder. You know, it's a huge problem. Uh, it's a huge yeah. problem. And it's known as the anti-riot bill, people. So just, just so you know what we're talking about here. Uh, I mean, uh, initial thoughts, um, you know, with the way that it's uh, it's just like a lot of other crafty pieces of legislation, the way that they're worded. Um, <clears throat> It's, you know, a lot of people are against rioting, so a lot of people sh- should support this, right? Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, anti-rioting, uh, you know, it, it's a lot more than that. Uh, it's obviously, it's a lot more than that. Um, I, uh, I view this as a, um, as, as a, a freeze on free speech. Uh, maybe, maybe not a freeze per se, but a, a chill. I think you use the word chilling effect um in your episode perhaps um i i think it kind of is like a chilling effect on on free speech and um because uh, like riots are not planned right Uh, you know they don't happen uh well let let me say let me let me rephrase this um they probably are planned to some degree uh right maybe for some people you know maybe they had the intention maybe they were organized but for a lot of the places where riots happen uh, or with the wordage that they're using in this bill, they're usually in conjunction with something that was already planned, like a peaceful protest or something. And usually right. at, the end, at the end of it, you know, stuff starts going sideways and agitators show up. And, um, you know, this bill makes it really difficult to separate who is uh, peacefully assembling uh, with their rights lawfully and airing their grievances and who is there for just willful destruction of private property. Right. And it kind of, bl- to me, it kind of blurs those lines to the point where someone who wants to go out without destroying property, air their grievances against the state or something, um, they're going to be fearful of getting caught up in some sort of umbrella dragnet Right. Uh, but this bill begins to open up on people. So th- right. th- those are my initial thoughts. 
Gotcha. All right, so let's talk about some details here. So the bill is 61 pages long. However, it does amend like 16 <coughs> statutes. It creates about four others. And I believe I did a count and there were like 111 other statutes that are referenced. Um, so we're not going to be able to necessarily do a full on uh, a bill review on the entire thing. So we'll have to just kind of narrow it down to some specifics and uh, because it would take quite a bit of time just to do this particular one because it, you'd have to start looking at some of the other referenced um, referenced ordinances uh, in the statutes in order to really get a good sense. There were two particular areas that I was troubled with this, okay? And the very first one, it starts out with the, you, you know, with the, uh, with the declaration of what it's kind of intending to do um in in one of the the big major areas and it amends statute 166.241 if you're you know one of those kind of people that wants to go look it up so i'm going to go ahead and put it up on the screen um what it is that that we're looking at here we'll take a uh, we'll take a look at oops um what this bill is actually doing and let's let's see what we can come up with here so let me go ahead and um let's see here oh it's gonna take me just a second here i was not quite as set up as i thought i was here for just a minute folks so give me a second while i get my scrolling to where it needs to be okay perfect so there we are so let's go ahead and put this up on the screen here so we're going to do do uh, folks, we're trying some some new stuff here, so bear with me as I work it on out. So here we are. Bam. All right. So here's what it says. <clears throat> it says, quote, um, let me let me you know, let me know if you can read it. It says if a tentative budget of a municipality contains a funding reduction to the operating budget of the municipal law enforcement agency, the state attorney for the judicial circuit in which the municipality is located or a member of the governing body who objects to the funding reduction may file an appeal by petition to the administrative administration commission within 30 days after the day the tentative budget is posted to the official website of the municipality under subsection three. So basically what we've got here, bring myself back up on the screen. Basically what we've got is this prevents the defunding of the police. This is my first major issue. And it's an issue because it puts into law and says that, that municipalities, cities, towns are not able to decide for themselves technically the amount of funding that the law enforcement are getting. Now, it's this language is specific <clears throat> to the defunding and we're going to get into uh, a little bit more why i think it goes a little bit further than this um, but it's not explicit uh, so what this does is it says hey if the the town if the city if like say jacksonville if the citizens started you know raising hell and saying look we think you need to defund the police we think that you need to do some things change of policing whatever the case may be then um, the mayor might go, ahead and say, okay, might go ahead and say, okay, well, let's go ahead and uh, reduce the budget here a little bit. And somebody might say, hey, whoa, 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 no, you can't do that. And so they can appeal now to the state. The problem with this is it takes away from the governing, the governance of the people in this city. So the city of Jacksonville, we would presume, is best fit to determine how they should be governed and what the money uh, should be used for in their particular city. And I find this a problem. It's, it's called home rule. And I find this a problem, especially in the conversation between states and federal, because it's really it's really the same issue. Same issue is that you've got states that say, look, we're going to run our thing. You know, we're going to do things the way we want. And the federal government might say, well, you know, you need to do these. And the states can say, go kick rocks. And I think that we should also uh, have, have that set up. <clears throat> uh, equally available to cities and towns so that's that's my first major issue um, is that we're we're basically taking away this idea of home rule for people now i will extend it a little bit further and say that people law enforcement 
will end up having a little bit more weight in taxation than do citizens. And that's not going to be readily apparent until we get to the next section. So let me go ahead and pull that up on the screen and then we'll we'll see what Josh has to say. Maybe I'm all wrong. Maybe he's maybe he's got some things to educate me on. Who knows? We'll see. So let's go ahead and put that up on the screen here. And do, do. All right, so let's see, that's the section that we were at. So we go down to, we scroll down here. So you've got all these deletions and then some of the same. All right, so now what we've got here is it says, a municipality has a duty to allow the municipal law enforcement agency to respond appropriately, to protect persons and property during a riot or an unlawful assembly based on the availability of adequate equipment to its municipal law enforcement officers and relevant state and federal laws. If the governing body of a municipality or a person authorized by the governing body of the municipality breaches that duty, the municipality, here's the key, is civilly liable for any damages, including damages arising from personal uh, injury, wrongful death, or property damages proximately caused by the municipality's breach of duty. So basically what we're saying here now is that if a city does not, <clears throat> uh, if a city is, is, is guilty of interfering with law enforcement's ability to protect people, to protect property, they could be held liable. So if a riot breaks out in Jacksonville and I'm a store owner and my building gets burned down and I can go back and I can say, well, <laughs> hey, you know what? It's, it's your fault, city, city leaders, because you defunded the police or, as I would argue, you didn't give them the money that they requested. Because what you have going, what, what happens here is they're liable for the law enforcement not being adequately able to protect my stuff. So if the law enforcement says, we need more officers, we need bigger guns, we need tanks. Okay, maybe tanks is an exaggeration. But if we, no, you know, if the law enforcement says we need this stuff in order to do our job, and then they don't get it, the city could be liable. So I look at this and I say, it's kind of like the sneaky underhanded way of basically giving law enforcement a little bit more weight in the community than the citizens because the citizens of jacksonville could say no we don't want the law enforcement to have this kind of equipment in fact we want you to scale it back and we think that you have too many officers um you know doing this or that or whatever and the law enforcement or somebody could say nope uh you know and they could make an, a, a petition they could uh, uh petition an appeal if there's a reduction but if there's no reduction if they just don't get it there's still the opportunity for the city to be liable later. Nobody likes to be liable. And when people think that they might be liable, they take extra precautions to ensure hmm. their, their own protection. Basically, they're going to save their ass. All right. Where am I wrong on this, Josh? I, I don't say that you're wrong anywhere. I, I'm just... Uh... I'm not sure you've taken it far enough. I, I'm going to tie this in later uh, with after we cover Senate the Senate Bill uh, 937. Mm -hmm. um, but this does quite a number of, of things. And, and I think it, anybody looking at this subjectively is going to know that this is that we're just at the beginning of this, right? Um, that this is going to end up in a lot of legal uh, litigation, a lot of back and forth. Um, you're completely right. This is this is a um, the home rule, uh, if you will. Um, the local control is absolutely being undermined. Uh, that's there. There's no doubt about that. Um, the I'm under the impression, at least under the belief, that uh, how your tax money, since you have to pay it, is is allocated. Uh, it, locally uh, mm -hmm. you, you should have a say in how your funds are being used right right and 
if if your community has gotten together and has decided that you want to change the police force, um, you should be able to to do that without. Uh, a very vocal minority issuing a grievance up to the state to have your decision over overrode. Um, right. So we're in agreement with that, right? You, we were kind of yeah. saying the same thing. Okay. So, um, and then on the flip side of that, you know, with the the liability, you know, to me that that's interesting. You know, that's going to be really interesting to see how it plays out because uh, the viewers may or may not be aware that the United States Supreme Court has ruled that law enforcement does not have a constitutional duty to protect you. Right. So all, all this is going to come come around because if you're creating a, a structure where you're saying uh, it's the police's responsibility to protect your property and to do all of these things, which is, is a big discussion. I'm not necessarily saying they shouldn't be. Right? There, there, there are certain functions, I think, that are um more than reasonable for a, a law enforcement group to do. But um, how are they going to protect that liability? Does this right. mean that they're going to uh, get the tanks out, uh, you know, and, and start uh, becoming a, a policing more aggressively? Uh, well, uh, how, this bill actually gives them the ability to police more aggressively. Um, they can arrest non-discriminately just basically you know if you're you're at a place where there's there's a riot going on uh, you'll be arrested your due process will be removed uh right you're, um you know there's so many things with this so like it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out i think it's important for people to understand that there's a lot of things at play here and we we are just now getting started but i we need to keep an eye on the most important thing to me of all of this is to keep an eye on, on where the power is moving right mm -hmm. the power on this it, it's it's moving up it's not moving down it's moving away from a home rule we're moving th this is a power move outside of your community and it's moving that um that power structure uh to more of a central location Th that's right. what this is and, yeah, and, that's and I, mm -hmm. I think you're right when you say we're going to really hit up on that when we get to the senate bill 937 yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So stay tuned, folks. If you're watching and you're like, "Ah, oh, this is kind of boring," I'm telling you, just push through because we're gonna, we're gonna really. I these, think we're gonna things, blow your these, mind. These things tie together, and you know. Oh yeah. I, I know. I, I absolutely know. Look, politics can be boring as hell for people. I completely get it, and I'll be honest with you. I, I, I there's aspects of politics that I like. Obviously, I do this show, mm -hmm. but a lot of this is out of necessity. Uh, people need to understand what is happening. And they're not going to come out and say uh, you're not going to get like an objective from most media, at least like, hey, guys, this is what's going on. You need to watch out uh, or, hey, guys, you know, you're not going to get that. So, you know, as boring as this stuff is at times, uh, you got you got to you got to stay on top of it because it's it's going to impact your life. All right. So I want to make two analogies real quick, just to really hit home at this, because you've got an explicit and you've got an implicit incentive here, right? The explicit incentive is to say, look, if somebody complains, uh, if they don't like the defunding, and this is explicitly to reduction in funding, then they can seek uh, authority, a higher authority. They can reach out to the state government and say, hey, we see uh, this issue here. So it's not really that you can't reduce the funding. It's just, you know, it's a matter of if somebody wants to object to it, I would expect that police departments, law enforcement, and other people would almost always say we should reduce funding because I've never heard of anybody in government that says, you know what? Turns out we have too much money here. We're just going to go ahead and give that back. <laughs> so my two analogies here when we're talking about incentives imagine if you because we're because the implicit one is the is the challenging one where i'm saying hey i think that uh th there's an incentive for local towns to increase the budget right um and so think of it this way imagine that a town says okay if at any time somebody from the street can see in your home and see something inappropriate maybe you're watching an inappropriate film maybe you're doing something inappropriate when i say inappropriate i just mean inappropriate for 
outside viewers, right? Like, you know, I don't really mean that the actual activities are inappropriate necessarily. So let's say that, you know, you're enjoying some alone time with a significant <clears throat> other. Let's say that you're watching a film that has some steamy scenes in it, right? Uh, and you're watching it on your big 65 inch screen television, which can be visibly seen outside of your house on the street. And let's just say that, you know, some school kids are walking by and they can see this. So imagine <clears throat> that, that the town passes an ordinance and says, anytime that somebody can look into your window and see this stuff, you are potentially guilty. And they can bring a lie, they can bring a civil lawsuit against you and say, you hurt my eyes with all your nakedness or with whatever it is that you were watching on TV, right? What's going to happen is that people will go through great lengths to to keep themselves protected because nobody wants to be liable for it. Now, there might be a few people that'll say, you know what, I'm going to push it. And then if somebody brings a claim against me, I'm going to court and I'm going to fight this. There'll be a few, but most people are going to look at it and they're going to say, man, I want to put up some heavy duty curtains. I'm going to turn my television the opposite direction. Uh, you know, I'm going to build a fence that's like, instead of four foot tall, it's going to be like eight feet tall, right? And it's not going to be lattice. It's going to be, you know, you know, wood by wood by wood all the way across, whatever. People are going to be incentivized. It wasn't explicitly told that they had to do this. It was just saying, hey, you know what? If this can happen, you might be found guilty. Well, the same thing applies to our, your local government. If the government is told, hey, you could be liable if this happens, they're going to go out of their way. It doesn't matter, like in the analogy, it doesn't matter if the person never has seen a child walk by or anybody walk by their home, right? They might just say, hmm, you know what? I better just be on the safe side, right? Mm -hmm. Well, governments really love to be on the safe side because anytime a politician gets caught, I don't want to say caught, but anytime a politician finds themselves in a situation where they are blamed for a particular action, that's no good. That doesn't help their career. So it, it does help their career to say, well, look at all these things that I did. Basically, look at all this money that I spent. Mm -hmm. And then they end up uh, spending it later to say, see how great it was, see what the ben benefit was, even if the benefit really isn't there. It's easier to spin something into being a benefit than to spin something that was a negative, at least back to a neutral position. So this is the kind of thing that will, re will really incentivize. And after all that, I forgot my second analogy. If I remember it in time, we'll go ahead and go over it. But this, the next portion of this bill that I want to discuss is about the, uh, 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 about the terms under which somebody is arrested. So let's go ahead and bring up this next section. And uh, because I think that this is the this is the second area that I have a problem. So the first area is, hey, we're we're getting in, we're interfering with home rule. The second area is, let's take a look. All right, so we got that up on the screen, and it defines mob intimidation. So this is a new section because it's underlined, and here's what it says: It says it's unlawful for a person assembled with two or more other persons and acting with a common intent to use force or threaten to use imminent force to compel or induce or attempt to compel or induce another person to do or refrain from doing any act or to assume, abandon, or maintain a particular uh, viewpoint against his or her will. And then you skip to the number three there and it says a person arrested, this is the part that I have a problem with, a person arrested for a violation of this section shall be held in custody until brought before the court for admittance to bail in accordance with chapter 903. So if you're, if, if you're already astute and you already understand what that means, what we're basically saying here is if there's a riot or an unlawful assembly and a person is arrested, they are going to be held and they don't get to post bail um, they, they have to be held until they are, uh, they, they go before, um, a, a court magistrate or a judge to determine bail. Okay. So here's the problem that I have with this. Just because you're arrested doesn't mean you're guilty. 
So what they're doing is they're detaining you. And how long can they detain you? I don't know. That's the thing. There's no, there's no requirement that it can be up to a certain amount of days. So if you're not scheduled, let's assume that they, they arrest 50 people. And for whatever reason, they're going to split it up into three different groups. Okay. I don't know. I'm, I'm making stuff up because I don't, I'm not entirely, I'm not a lawyer. Okay. This is all lay reading. This is all just me as average Joe citizen reading this, you know, John Q public here. Um, so what I imagine could happen is that you could be held for a relatively long amount of time while you're waiting for an opportunity to go before a judge or a magistrate or whomever it is that you need to go before. And so all this time, you're, you're being held in detention on, because you were arrested for being suspected of guilty of a crime. Because you are, you are never guilty just because you were arrested. You are arrested because you are suspected of being guilty. Because an officer is out there to enforce the law, and it's up to his or her discretion to determine whether or not you're violating the law. Then you go before a judge, and then the judge or a jury of your peers will determine if you actually violated the law or not. And in some cases, it will be found that you did not violate the law. There was no evidence that you violated the law. Okay, you were not found guilty of violating the law. Okay, so we're detaining people until uh, some such time, and then they can potentially post bail. Okay, so I, I find this problematic because I don't know what that time frame is. And if they've arrested a lot of people, maybe there's a chance that, you know, they're walking through the letters. Maybe they bring everybody in all at once, kind of similar to like, say, a, a traffic court hearing. I'm not really sure how it all happens. Even if they bring you in as a group, maybe they don't split you up. That group, you know, there may not be an opportunity for a week or two to come before the judge or the magistrate. So I have a problem with this because we're detaining people longer than what I believe is necessary because we haven't found them guilty just yet. That's the key. What am I missing, Josh? Uh, you're not missing anything. Um, I, um, I'm going to take this just a little bit further because, you know, this is what I do. <laughs> yeah. um, I have a major problem just like you with mob intimidation, right? Right. The way that that's worded, the way that it's laid out, um, if you'd go by that definition of mob intimidation, um, that something actually, something, nothing has to actually be physically done. That's what people need to understand. Um, you don't have to actually destroy property, harm anybody, or even directly threaten the physical safety of an, another person. Uh, to be uh, charged with this or to be accused of this, should I say. But that definition, if we actually applied it to state and local governments and the federal governments, they would all have to arrest themselves. Yeah. It, 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 you know, it's um, how this is, th this is worded is actually pretty insidious. And you said, how long do they have to uh, detain them? Mm -hmm. I got a really strong feeling uh, that was left blank on purpose. Um, and this all ties back into the 2012 National Defense Authorization Act, indefinite detention. Um, they are slowly tying this into a RICO type scenario where you can mass group and charge people together. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that they are altering the words of domestic terrorists um, what this does to me, I, in, now how this plays out, I don't know how this is going to play out. Right. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, being a obviously a, a libertarian, I have views that are not necessarily mainstream. Uh, we were adamantly against lockdowns before anybody else was, before it was popular for Republicans to try to be against lockdowns. I mean, I remember when uh, our, our great Republican governor here in the state of Florida locked the state of Florida down and, you know, Republicans were cheering. Right. I remember that. Remember that wasn't that long ago, was it? You know, right, right. It's amazing how they forget these things. Um, you know, th this is a a terrible direction we're going here. 
uh, you know, I, I, that's, that's really all I can say about it. I, I think it's, I, I don't want to say too much because I want I want to tie this in Senate bill 937 at the end, but th- this is a bad deal. Uh, the mob intimidation um, th- that's extremely interpretational. It's a uh, very interpretational and um, it, there's, there's some bad, bad things here. This is not a good bill. Gotcha. Okay. It's, it's, so let's read the next section because it gets a little bit worse. Okay. So now this one said that what we just read was, hey, when there's mob intimidation, you know, and, and it defines it, and you know, you've got this riot that's going on, and or maybe there's an unlawful assembly, and I think there's a definition in there for that. Um, you know, then it says, okay, if you're you're arrested, then you know, you you you're held until you you post bail. So here's this next section. Let's go ahead and read this one. All right, so we've got it says a person. Now this is under this is under the context of let's see if we can pull that back up here, go back up a little bit here. Okay, it's probably up a little bit too far, but this is talking about theft now during a riot. So what they're doing is they're now saying, all right, there's theft and then there's theft during a riot. Opportunist, uh, opportunism, okay? And so it says a person arrested for committing a theft during a riot or an aggravated riot or within a <coughs> county that is subject to a state of emergency may not be released until the person appears before a committing magistrate at a first appearance hearing. Okay. So I want you to really take heart to that, that we're now, we're, we're, we're being very, very clear here. It says they may not be released. And it gives three conditions. If you're arrested for theft, either during a riot, an aggravated riot, and I'd have to go back and look and see what exactly an aggravated riot is, or a state of emergency. Now, let me tell you, the uh, the, the way that the Florida statutes work, a, a, a mayor or, you know, whoever's in charge of the town or uh, town or city can uh, declare a state of emergency, okay? and um, and I, and I think it's necessarily a good thing that we don't allow people to, to to steal during a state of emergency. And I think that it's fair to say, hey, there's if you're going to be opportunistic, then we're going to punish you a little bit harder. I'm okay with that in itself. Okay, and the re- here's the reason why, folks, because I think that it takes a certain level of nerve to go and rob during just everyday normal circumstances to, to go and steal something. I think it takes a little bit less nerve to do so when there's an actual state of emergency. So when, when a hurricane hits Florida and, you know, things are, you know, people are all hunkering down and, you know, they bought, you know, all the water that they're allowed to buy and all that good stuff. Yes, there is an, you know, they are preoccupied. So it makes it a little bit more opportunistic for people to go and say, oh, you know, I'm going to go ahead and steal something. And they might, there's a chance that they might get away with it, or at least that's that's their thinking, right? Like, hey, this person's preoccupied, so I can go and do this other, uh, this deed. So it's not that I'm, it's not that I want to support anybody stealing stuff. Um, But the problem that I have with it is that it explicitly says that you have to be detained until such a time. So imagine that an officer sees you and thinks that you've stolen something it says hey you citizen you stop right there i'm I, I i'm accusing you of stealing this property and you say well i'm not i'm telling you i'm not stealing this property you know whatever the scenario is, is at the time but you insist you're not stealing any property the officer says no i'm pretty sure i saw you stealing i'm pretty sure that what i've saw uh, amounts to you stealing so you get arrested and then now you have to be held again, similar to the last portion that we read. You're being held until you can be brought before somebody to deal with this. So now imagine that you've been falsely accused of stealing. Cause that's basically what an arrest is. It's an officer accusing you of doing something. You've been falsely accused of theft. You've been, you've been arrested, you're held and your job is called and you're saying, Hey, you know what, where are you? How come you didn't make it to work on time? Right? And then let's just say that you get into some sort of trouble with your work because your work is not obligated to wait and find out if <clears throat> your arrest was, uh, you know, turns out to be legitimate or not. We're getting heavy rain here, Josh. So, and folks, just you know, don't mind the interruption here. I'm getting heavy rain here because this is Florida. So, Josh, if we get disconnected, we'll we'll figure it out. So, at any rate. 
That's my problem here. We're now arresting people and we're holding them indefinitely. I don't like the idea of detaining people any longer than is absolutely necessary. Now, if an officer detains somebody who is, and arrests them for maybe stabbing some people or shooting up a place, I don't mind detaining that person because presumably the officer caught them in the act of doing it and there's a chance that maybe they'll continue that act if we let them go. We haven't had a chance to assess, okay, does this person have any uh, other violent activities that they're intending on? Do they have any other weapons that they that they're stored somewhere else that they that they need to go get? So I don't necessarily mind detaining somebody, you know, when we're talking about a really really serious crime. But if it's just like, hey, there was a riot here and we're going to arrest you, and you don't even get to post bail until you've been, you know, brought before somebody, I, I have a problem with that because a riot doesn't necessarily, just because there is a riot doesn't necessarily mean that you were engaged in any violent actions towards somebody else. Just because you were accused of stealing doesn't mean that you were necessarily um, engaged in any violent actions toward anybody else. So I, I look at it and I say, violent actions are kind of the area where we're gonna wanna really think about, maybe it's, an, uh, maybe it's acceptable to detain, to detain a person under certain circumstances. Uh, but some of these other ones, I'm not so convinced. What say you, Josh? Well, um, I, I'm not sure that I could actually put my full disdain uh, for this bill uh, into words right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so I apologize. I, <clears throat> ears ringing. I, lo I lost my track a few moments ago, uh, but I, I found it and I wrote it down so I'd remember. <laughs> right. I'd like to keep my notes. Um let me ask you this. Um, it doesn't delineate in the bill about state of emergency. It doesn't talk about if it's a mayor. It doesn't really necessarily talk about if it's a governor or federal, correct? I do not believe so, but I did not read it in full. Um, I just kind of was trying to keep to the parts where there were additions or changes, um, and I kind of skimmed over it a bit just to get a good sense and stopped in particular areas and then tried to try to focus on those particular areas. Um, from uh, my best reading of it and from a few people I've talked to, it's just state of emergency. Um, well, that how often could you be in a state of emergency? I, I didn't need to remind people we're under a federal state of emergency right now. Right. Probably will be indefinitely. Uh, we're under a state in Florida state of emergency and various counties have got states of emergency still up. So um, I know DeSantis has played with the wording a little bit with these executive orders, but I'm pretty sure we're still, he, he reauthorized it or under state of emergency, correct? Is that right? Yes. Okay. So as of right now, uh, this bill would be in, in, in effect if it's already posted its effect date. I, I don't know when its effect date is. I know it's passed. Right. So you can be detained. Um, basically uh without due process right now um under this bill for just about whatever they want and earlier i'd mentioned i said well we're libertarians we've been you know grip griping about the lockdown since day one been out protesting been out waving flags you know i'm not i don't want to necessarily say that i'm not a lawbreaker but I, i'm not a violent person okay i'm not out there mm -hmm. your stuff i'm not you know <clears throat> that, that's not what i'm doing you know, uh, but I would be out protesting passage of this bill. You're, you're not going to see me anywhere. OK, you're not going right. to see me in Tallahassee standing in front of the steps. You're not going to see me uh, at our government center here in the county uh, doing these types of things, because what they have the ability to do now, like I said, it's it's a dragnet. You, you have given the, the police force right now. Uh, it's given them a blank check is what it's done. It's effectively mm -hmm. has given them a blank check to detain you and to, um, to put their hands on you and to detain you until a time that they later see fit. Right. That's what this boils down to. Right. Uh, they try to play with the words and stuff. Cause like, yeah, of course the L like if someone was committing a violent crime or doing this and that you, you want, obviously we think that someone should be able to be detained, right? Correct. You know, they yes. want them to continue the crime. I really have a problem with uh, the non-specific nature of this. I also have uh, an issue with um, the 
uh, how, how should I say this? Theft is theft, right? I, I, if you go in and you steal something, it doesn't, it, it shouldn't matter what the circumstances are. Uh, you know, whether if it's uh, opportunistic theft or, I mean, if we apply that to something else, let's, uh, how about opportunistic murder? I mean, a crime, the, the, the how should I say this, the partitioning of a crime and the, the using the person's intent and motivations, uh, I think is a very dangerous, slippery slope. And that'll it tie into, be. that'll tie into 937 later. Right. I, I, I prefer laws to be very objective and clear. Gotcha. Is, it a, is it a crime already to steal the property of another person? Right. Yes. You know, creating some sort of a, a striata for punishment based upon the prevalence of opportunity in these things is that that's how we get into the politicization of laws. And that, that's what we're going, you know, so. Basically, what I'm saying is this is a chilling effect because I'm already telling like openly and I'm an activist. I, I, I'm not going to be out there. Right. I'm not going to be out there because I'm not, that, not that going to get charged with terrorism because I right. want to end the lockdowns. And, and that has its own impact, folks. So check it out. Think of it this way. Imagine that um, imagine that Josh and, and myself are both willing to go out and protest. Right. And, and we've seen this happen. There is video footage. <clears throat> can find it out there but uh, imagine that uh, we go out there and we see a bad actor somebody who is uh, going a little bit above and beyond what we think is appropriate for uh, a protest we might be willing to say look dude you need to knock that off that's not cool stop it but if people like josh and i are now like saying hey you know what we're, we're incentivized to stay home because we don't want to get caught in, up in this then that means you're you're more than likely going to have an in it's, it's not really going to be an increase it's going to be a decrease in the people that are behaving more appropriately so you're going to it's effectively going to have more people that might be willing to behave inappropriately out on the streets and so therefore you might see the riots uh you know or protest turn more riotous uh more quickly more frequently oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, because look, you don't look, have people out there saying, hey, not acceptable, knock uh, it off. And we've, we've seen that this actually happened in both BLM riots. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, BLM protests and protests from people on the right. So, like, say, the Tea Party and whatnot. Mm. No, look, look, you've got you got bad actors out there. And when you get people out there, most people who protest, even most people who protested under with, with BLM, with under that that uh, banner facade. Most of them probably uh, had great intentions. You mm -hmm. know, uh, they were <clears throat> absolutely were peaceful. And while they were there and while they were present, they probably kept some of the others in check. Uh, I, I certainly wouldn't. Let me tell you, if I'm at a, a rally or a, um, and been to, uh, who, who knows how many I've been to over the years, you two DL, I'm sure. But if there's a if I'm in a place where I can I can leak lawfully carry, OK, I'll be carrying. Mm -hmm. And what would I use that weapon for? Well, I'll, I'll defend someone else's life, even a stranger. If I see them, uh, their natural rights being violated and then being put in a situation that, uh, you know, they're getting beat down. Um, yeah, if somebody's beating somebody over the head with a skateboard, uh, you know. I'll defend you. If I see someone trashing your property or home, I'm going to watch out for you too. I watch out for my neighbors because that's the type of society I'm in. So like, I, I don't necessarily want to use the word sheepdog, but I've got the personality where I'm going to look out for your stuff. Right. I'm going to look out for other people. And, and you know, there's a lot of people like that. There's, a, you know, a, a, I'd say a vast majority of the people that I've ever, uh, protested with or have done those types of things are the type of people that you know when something's going wrong when somebody's you know messing with things of yours or the wolf's growling at the door these are the type of people you want on your team right <clears throat> you are silencing them and and those people who would normally be watching out for you or uh keeping uh let's just say the rabble of society in check just by pre our presence uh, not even necessarily our words or our actions, but just our presence and our demeanor. Right. 
when you remove that from the equation, uh, you know, what you get from that is going to be um, more chaos. It'd be like if you took all the good out of all the people who were there protesting for the best reasons of BLM mm -hmm. and you remove them and you made BLM be just the crowd that showed up after midnight. Right. Um, you know, you're going to you're going to get bad outcomes. Right. And, and not to mention the indirect causes of this, because we're not protesting anymore, because we're not out there being vocal, trying to facilitate change and to push back against the government and our peaceful uh, ways that are uh, that are our natural rights to um, air our grievances. We're being silenced. So the, the system of checks and balances from the uh, fourth branch of government, the people. Right. Uh, is being is being chilled and, and this is one of the time like there's a lot of times like i i disagree with the aclu mm -hmm. uh you, you know but this is not one of them the aclu in florida's absolutely got this right on this is a this is a bad deal all the way around and um i you know there are there's problems i think they're trying to address with this uh you know you see the cities you saw what happened in minneapolis where you mm -hmm. the police force gets pulled back and people and their property and their homes and these things are just left to the wind. You know, I think most people would agree that that's not the way to handle this. Right. And if you think about this all the way through, just blank defunding the police is not the way to handle this. That's the equivalent of saying, hey, uh, law enforcement officer, uh, you know, you get one tank of gas per week. Let's just say that's what it was before. Defunding them is just saying, OK, now you got to do the same thing with a half a tank of gas. Right. You haven't changed the structure of how they operate and how they enforce the law. Right. Um, so instead of changing that, uh, now what they're doing is they're just giving uh, law enforcement a blank check to uh, detain people. And um, it's creating some insidious roads. That's what I'll say. I just, like I said, I, I want to reiterate, like, I, I want to be clear, like, I'm not going to be protesting anymore. Right. So, yeah, so it's going to have an effect. It's creating a lot of incentives here. It's a lot, a lot of yeah. incentives. Incentives for the state or the city uh, <laughs> to go ahead and increase funding uh, for the police. It, oh, it, let me it, let me add to that too. About the, talking about incentives, talk about incentives. Uh, you know, DeSantis just did the. Uh, there, there's a thousand dollar bonus that's going to be going out to all law enforcement officers in the state of Florida. Hmm. Uh, a hero fund and stuff. I think firefighters too are getting this. Uh, due to their service during uh, COVID-19. Uh, COVID so, like, there are incentives all over and on both sides. And, and honestly, none of the incentives are incentives that are beneficial to the average citizen. Gotcha. There's not. So you, you've got incentives all over the place. You've got incentives for this, the local governments to increase police funding. You've got... Uh, incentives for some people that might be good people that would keep things from spiraling out of control. Um, you got them that might be more willing to stay home. So we now, we now might see more incidents, more really negative incidents than we were before. So it, it may feel like, hey, things are getting out of control. And it may be less about things getting out of control and simply things not... Uh, uh, you know, not having people that would otherwise prevent these things present to keep them from, you know, and, and you can't always prevent everything, right? Like sometimes no. things will just pop off. They will, you know, so it doesn't, I'm not saying that, hey, if we don't pass these and a bunch of good guys are going to always be out there and everything is going to be peachy. It will never always be peachy. What I'm saying is it may get actually worse because now you may have the people that have been keeping some of the things from happening no longer there. And so now you're going to have more bad actors with less people directly by them trying to say, look, you need to knock this off. Not acceptable. Right? It'll be significantly easier too for narrative drivers to say that there is not opposition to something when there are not people in the streets. Right. You understand? It, 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 everything is complex and ties together. It's about social engineering too. They, they even try to, you know, manipulate camera angles to show si relative sizes of crowds, whether bigger or smaller, depending right. upon their respective narrative. But like, if there's nobody out in the street protesting or cut in half because they're afraid of whatever, you know, they, they easily played off as like, there's not a resistance to this. 
Right. You know, it's, it's, it's all insidious. So, so that's, that's HB1. It's already been passed. We're opposed to it. It's not that we necessarily oppose the idea of uh, bringing people to justice. It's not that I necessarily that we oppose all detention necessarily. Uh, you know, there, there is a time and a place for many things, but they need to be made explicit and they need to be made explicit so that they address as much as they can only the problem that is actually in uh, present. And they need not to be so vague such that it offers incentive for people to do something otherwise you know and, and it's it's a balancing act it really is because on one hand you want to incentivize people that might be um, you know deciding to go out and stir up some trouble to not stir up trouble but at the same time you want to balance that with uh you know not incentivizing people to stay home who might be there helping to prevent those troublemakers from stirring up the trouble so let's table let, let's go ahead and move on next to hb 1475 we talked about 937 that's going to be the third third one that we're going to get to but let's talk about uh, hb 1475 and that is the that, that that's the bill uh the fairness in women's sports act and this bill came to my attention from seeing a number of news articles and people on social media claiming that this bill requires the inspection of genitals that was the big one uh, but some places, some people were even saying, hey, this is basically like pedophilia. This is basically like um, sexual assault. And so that really got my attention. OK, because I'm like, wow, like we're going to pass a bill that's going to basically be assaulting kids in school sexually like this is this is really, really amazing. So we can get a good sense of what this bill does on lines four through seven of the first page. So let me go ahead and pull that uh, that bill up. So let's go ahead and we'll get our, our document here going. And let's see here. Get this bill right on up here. So, all right, I'll look over to my secondary screen here as we, we get things moving right along. Do, do. All right. So, all right, all right, there we are. So let's go ahead and bam, there we go on the screen. So it's requiring that certain athletic teams or sports sponsor, uh, sponsored by certain educational institutions be designated on the basis of students' biological sex. So that's the first thing. And then I believe if we scroll down here, we get a little bit more. And uh, let's see here. Oh, you know, we'll hold off on that one. And we will just... Uh, Give me just a second here, folks. A lot of clicking I got to do. A lot of clicking. I need an assistant. Just kidding. I don't need an assistant. <laughs> but I do. I need yeah, I one do too, man. named <laughs> Zach, who's a young guy that can do it on the side. And I can be like, all right, good job, son. That's okay. Nice. Give him a so, here. All right. So basically, it's an attempt to prevent transgender um, males, or uh, I, I, actually, I think it's transgender females, I, I think actually is technically uh, the, the correct uh, identification from participating in sports that are dedicated to female sports. Okay. And so then we, uh, then, okay. So the, and, and what I wanted to pull up and I don't think I've got a highlight so I'll have to kind of try to highlight it on the spot here. Um, so then we go to page two and we're looking on lines 34 through 41 because we can see the legislative intent there. So let me go ahead and pull that up really quickly here. So we pull that up and we see that the intent, and this is actually not page two, give me just a second here, let's go back up to page two. So here's our legislative intent right there. It is not highlighted, so I apologize for that, folks. It is the intent of the legislator to maintain opportunities for female athletes to demonstrate their skill, strength, and athletic abilities while also providing them with opportunities to obtain recognition and accolades, college scholarships, and the numerous other long-term benefits that result from success in athletic endeavors and to promote sex equality by requiring the designation of separate sex-specific athletic teams or sports. So that's what we got. That's what we got there. So already, I have some issues here. And the issue is before we even get to the, the, the issues of sex, gender, uh, transgender students, or even equality, the problem that I have with this is that the government is doing something that I believe it is not supposed to be doing. In my belief, the government's role is not, I repeat, is not to maintain opportunities for female athletes to demonstrate their athletic skill, much less provide any reward for doing so. 
Same goes for male athletes. However, we're going to define them. Doesn't matter. And then I also disagree that it's the government's role to promote sex equality for the very reasons that this bill exists. That's because right now, sex equality is being heavily debated. So long as your side is winning, then you probably will be supporting whatever bill is being presented. However, that's the problem because for the side that is losing, it doesn't matter who is right or wrong because it ultimately ends up coming down to a matter of power. So that's the issue that I, I take immediately from this bill is I'm like, hey, you know what? You're already assuming authority in a particular area that you don't belong uh, exerting your authority. And it ends up becoming a big power play because one group might say, hey, you know what? We feel like uh, this would really be um, protecting our rights. And another group might say, whoa, whoa, whoa. We think that you're actually getting a little bit more than what you deserve, right? That, 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 that you're framing it as equality, but it's really not equality, right? These are, these are the arguments. I'm not necessarily making them myself. I'm just saying these are the two arguments that we have. And so then it becomes a power play. And we're not really working out the details of this equality, what we're really doing is fighting for power. And so that's why I have this problem with, the, with saying that the government's job is there to promote sex equality um, or any of these other things because it becomes a big fight for power. Josh, I know that you are in the medical community. Uh, before we get into in, in, in that, or maybe you just want to dive right into it, what are your thoughts so far in this bill? Um, well, before I dive into that, I, I, what you're saying right there, um, right off the bat, I, I don't think this is a place for the government, right? I, you know, I, I completely agree with everything you said. Um, unfortunately, um, this is a system we have, right? Um, right. You know, uh, so I, I don't think um, the government has a role in defining uh, sexuality. I don't think the government has a role in to, I, I guess the word, way I word equality, perhaps. Okay. Uh, making people equal. Um, I, I don't think that that's something that should be a role. I think that's a social issue. Mm -hmm. uh, with that being said, um, your sports teams for 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 girls, uh, for boys too, everybody. Uh, most of them are ran. Uh, it's they're by their state ran. You know, every absolutely every faucet of it goes through the state, whether if it's uh, if you're healthy enough to participate. You talked about the physicals, you know, there's safety reasons. Mm -hmm. People don't realize how many how many uh, adolescent children die in athletics every year for right. medical right. reasons, un undisclosed medical reasons that they, they weren't aware that they had. So whether if we like it or not, at this point in time, um, the uh, government is absolutely intertwined with everything including our uh, academic sports for uh, our children. <clears throat> right. Now, obviously you got city leagues and stuff that are private and uh, you know, all, all that's good. But so far as the government goes, the, just the government, like private entities, if you've got a private uh, pop Warner league that wants to mm -hmm. do whatever they want, none of what I'm about to say applies to that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think it's title nine. You, you've got protections for people. Uh, you know, you don't want the government to treat people differently. Right. You want right. to provide it. The government should be providing equal opportunity. Well, we set that equal opportunity on male and female, the biological sexes. So men, you have equal, you got a, a sport, you can go competing females. Here's your sport. You can, you know, your sports, your sports team, you can go play on um, making the uh, female teams co-ed in essence is what you're doing uh a lot of people say that that's a legal violation of of title nine you know it's a violation of women uh, of women and for those who are listening to me talk this is a disclaimer okay people can live their life however they want i don't discriminate on that i don't pass judgment on the way you choose to live your life uh, that's one thing that makes me a libertarian. But one thing people confuse about libertarians, they think that that means that that's their personal disposition too. Don't get me wrong. I, I have I have friends that uh, are transgender. I have patients that are transgender. I, I talked about that previously before. But since the government is involved and there are state schools and people have no choice, 
I do support this bill. Um, we need to protect women. We need to protect girls. They should be able to uh, have an equal opportunity to compete amongst each other and not have um, biological males competing against them. I'll, 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 pause, I'll, I'll pause right there for you to continue on because I want to say a few other things about this bill. But I'll, Sure, I'll stop. sure. So now, now we are in disagreement on this because <coughs> I oppose the bill, but I generally, when I oppose the bill, it's usually because I read through the bill and I don't like what I see in there yeah. about certain things. And so I may or may not necessarily, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that I disagree with somebody else who actually supports the bill. We might actually agree in certain areas. I just see some things about the bill that I find problematic. And one of the things that I want to point out about this particular bill is that in the conversation, observations over the conversation of gender and sex, the debate that, that's being had, suggest that maybe opponents uh, are kind of getting bit a little bit by this particular bill <clears throat> because they have, they have very vocally claimed that gender and, uh, and sex are distinct. Now, we're not going to go into whether or not they are or they're not and what does you know, this research study say or whatever. I'm not really going to get into that. But, you know, and, and they'll point out that gender is a social construct, okay? Well, this bill sidesteps that by simply using sex as the distinguishing characteristic. And it distinguishes sex uh, uh, on the basis of three types of teams. You've got the male, you've got female, and then you've got co-ed. And so then this leads to where the issue of inspecting genitals comes into play. So if we go over to page three, and let's go ahead and pull that back up here real quick. So we're going to pull that back up, and we're going to go over to page three, and we're going to lines 55. Oop, already had it there. Lines 55 through 66. Here's what it says. It says, a dispute regarding a student's sex shall be resolved by the student's school or institution by requesting that the student provide a health examination and consent form or other statement signed by, they, by the student's personal health care provider, which must verify the student's biological sex. The health care provider may verify the student's biological sex as part of the routine sports physical, that Josh mentioned a moment ago, examination by relying on one or more of the following. One, the student's reproductive anatomy. Two, the student's genetic makeup. Or three, the student's normal endog endogenously produced testosterone levels. Okay, so that's so so we're 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 getting now to where uh, we're, we're we're determining. Let me bring myself back up here. Lost my little lost my spot here. Going to have to work on making this a little bit quicker so that people can see my beautiful smiley face. So now we're getting into the part where we're uh, where we're identifying specifically what it is that their their the bill is doing that people are, are are throwing a fit about and they're calling it an inspection bill. And um, the, the problem that I have is that people are presenting it as if the school sh is doing the inspection. But it's not true. It's a healthcare provider that's doing it, and it's part of a a, a routine sports physical in examination. And here's the thing: that's what healthcare providers do. They yeah. examine the body based on whatever the need is, say a physical or symptoms. You know, if I go to my healthcare provider and I say, "Hey, I've I'm I'm, I'm feeling some things," right? And many males that have participated in sports will tell you that a sports physical comes with this placement of fingers in an uncomfortable place while being asked to turn their head and cough, <laughs> right? And this is to determine if the person has any sign of inguinal hernia, which can be exacerbated by the rigors of sports involvement. Now, you might ask, DL, how would you know about that? Were you a big sports player? Oh, you know, I played a little bit of sports, and I had an inguinal hernia. Actually, I had it on the right and the left. So I'm very, oh. very familiar with this particular process, and I'm familiar with what happens when you have an inguinal hernia. You go and you have surgical, uh, the, you have a surgical procedure to resolve it. And then once I have that, once I had that surgical procedure, I was cleared to go back and play. Okay. So, so what's going on here is the argument is being framed like, oh, look at these schools. They're just gonna, they're gonna set this situation up so that. Kids are going to have to go into the nurse's office, and the the principal is going to be doing it, right? Like may, they may not be specifying it exactly, but they're coming just shy of it, right? And 
if you would think you listen to some of these people, you'd think that these schools were having Catholic priests to come in to do this. Oh, yeah. And They're so that saying, people know we're not exaggerating. Yeah, let me pull ridiculous. something up. Let's pull this up. <laughs> Bam, right there. Florida advances sick bill that yeah. would let schools, <laughs> schools inspect teens' genitals in the name of transphobia. Now, skip the part about sick. Sick the part about stick, uh, uh, skip the part about transphobia and just focus on the the very center there that would let schools inspect teens genitals. That's not true. No. It, the bill explicitly says that it has to be a healthcare provider, and that is what healthcare providers do. So now I have a second example. We'll pull this example up since we're looking at them real quick. And so, so what we're looking here is pink news. This is from the UK. Um, but then there was a change.org petition, which got over 42,000 signatures. So I want to read a little bit from that one. So let's pull that one up. Ba bam There we are. And let me see here. Let me, let me get my other notes here. And so it says, this bans trans girls and women to play on school teams. It would also allow schools to require a genital inspection of student athletes suspected to be trans. So now that's, that's another issue, but beside the point, this is sexual assault, plain and simple. People can be so ignorant and disgusting. This is violating women, particularly trans women. I would never let anyone inspect my child for that ridiculous <laughs> reason. But here's the thing, folks. It is absurd to say that. Who's my, uh, there I am. That's absurd. Of course you would let somebody inspect your child if it was a medical procedure conducted by a member of the medical community, because that is what they do. In fact, probably your child has already been, I don't want to say inspected, but examined and your healthcare provider presumably knows that your child is a trans child because that is information that is extremely pertinent to the health of your child or anyone for that matter when we're talking about a healthcare provider. That doesn't necessarily mean that I agree with it. All I'm doing is I'm saying, look, I think that the opponents of this bill are stepping way out and they're making some exaggerated claims. And I think there are some problems related to that. So I'm going to stop here for a moment, and I'm going to hear what Josh has to say about everything we just saw and read here. All right. So I want to touch on the examination and all the hyperbolic stuff in, in one second. Uh, just to re reiterate my grievance with this, like if I was a legislator, um, this would not be an issue if the, if the government was not involved in public education. If education was private and people went where they voluntarily chose to do, they can do their voluntary associations, right? So ideally, that is my world. That, that's, where, um, that's where we would be, but we're not. We're in a place where uh, we have public involvement, and uh, so our children go to, a lot of them go to public schools. And, um, okay, so... Now we're staring at this bill. That's why I say I, I support it just because of, of the, the system that we have. Now, um, the health examination, all that's hyperbolic. I, I almost can't even. It's just so we, we can't even have a discussion, D.L., about what you and I actually would like to see happen because we have to deal with uh, a different argument. And this different argument often involves uh, hyperbolic type arguments like pink news and these types of things. Uh, it's sexual assault, they said. Okay, so how many state-required assessments of your child are there already? I mean, think you've got to think about this. From the time that they're born, they become a teenager, all the way through all that time, there's uh, mandatory checkups, uh, wellness screenings, all these types of things that have to be done, vaccinations, so you actually have to... Uh, not just examine them, but you have to actually give them medication without their uh, consent required for them to go to do these types of things. So th there's, there's not a peep from these people about any of that, right? Th th there's no words, there's no complaints, but here we are, this is transphobic, this is this and this is that. In the medical community, in the hospitals, pharmacies, doctors, offices, um, anywhere you go, whenever you go in as a patient, 
um, from the, your physical self, your biological being, the things that we could measure and analyze and treat uh, of those metrics, it's only your biological sex. Your gender is fluid. Now, that's been written by the APA, a bunch of studies and stuff. We understand the fluidity of gender. It is a subjective identity marker. Uh, nothing really has changed. There's not any new uh, science with tran transgenderism. I mean, you hear all these people talking. I keep saying it. I've beaten this like a dead horse. Mm -hmm. This is a subjective lifestyle, okay? This is a construct. Biology is biology. You know, I, I, you know this argument, you know, that takes it like, I don't believe a person has what's called a, a rights of projection. Okay. I can't fabricate something, even if it's believable or be, it is something right to me. I can't say, you know what? I choose to live my life um, a particular way. Right. I, I don't have the ability to project that to you and say, you have to accept this. You have to. No, I don't. Okay. You can live your life how you want, but that does not mean I have to accept it. And that's where we're getting into right now. Um, I don't like the uh, the politization of all of this. This is absolutely terrible. I, I, I keep going back to it. You know, who's suffering at the end of the day of all of this? Uh, transgender people, people who. Uh, oh, I think so. Th they're they're absolutely the ones that are suffering. And it's, it's a multifaceted problem, right? And if someone wants to be intellectually lazy and call me transphobic or all any other kind of whatever, look, you're lazy. I have hundreds of transgender patients, okay? I understand gender dysmor dysmorphia. I know the medications that they take. I know the transitions that they go through. Um, me saying that it is a construct is because the roles, the gender roles that we have presented uh, associated with this are societal constructs. Okay, there, there's a big difference between that and then how your body biologically functions. There's nothing wrong with saying that, okay? This is, and there, was, there wasn't anything wrong with saying that. 15 years ago, there was nothing wrong with saying that. A healthcare professional had to have no problem saying that. No problem right. whatsoever. Now, I can't even tell you how difficult it is uh, to treat transgender patients. The number of patients are going up. The patients are getting younger. And this is not, you and I have talked about this before. So I, I have a, I've got a problem with this entire narrative been pushed onto people. Gotcha. Um, now, if people want to participate in this and it's fine, but to me, the way I see it, I've got two girls, I've got two daughters. I want them to be able to compete in sports. If we were in the private sector mm -hmm. in, in which we are, my, my children are homeschooled, but if I know that's not true for everybody, if my girls want to compete in say basketball, right? They want to go play sports and basketball and they want to go play with other girls. What if it's the women's, the national basketball league, WNBA, whatever, whatever the case may be, they should be able to do it with other females biological females i mean i would choose to put them into that right if that's what they right. wanted if you're in the public school you're getting ready to lose that option now boys there's not an issue uh there, there's not an issue there but the other way around and here's the prime example i want to do just the other day the um and this is how pervasive this is becoming uh the international olympic committee uh, amended their qualifying rules due to the pandemic, which I'm not sure what these qualifying rules have anything to do with the pandemic, uh, but they are permitting a transgender weightlifter, Laurel Hubbard, um, to compete in this summer's Olympic Games. Uh, this, this, this individual has just been basically dominating every, everything, you know, basically lifting twice the amount of the next competitor. And the only rules of this was to, um, uh, the, let's see the test testosterone levels had to be below 10 nanomoles per liter for at least 12 months before the first competition. Look, you can inject steroids for years and then have it under, under that, that level in no time, no time at all. Uh, people who do, uh, the, the, uh, competition meets and things like that, they manipulate this system all the time. So they'll start to, the guy will start taking or the girl, excuse me, Laura will start 
taking uh, hormone blockers a year leading up to the, the competition won't really lose that much strength in a year's period of time. And the advantage will still be uh, significant, very okay. significant. Um, so you can say, okay, well, why don't we just make everything co-ed then? Which, you know, maybe that's the next step. Maybe we're moving to, maybe they're trying to force us into a unisex society. I, I, I don't really know. But I, the long, I, I don't know what the, the agenda here is. Uh, um, and I would not have a problem if everything came down to accepting the way people live their lives as being their own choice. I would be more than fine if that is where it stopped, but that's not where this is stopping. Okay. This, this is, this is not a good direction. I, I I'm thinking more than likely, we're probably going to look back at this in 20, 30 years, and we're going to see some of the stuff that we're doing here. And um, it's going to be an embarrassing time, embarrassing time to look back at. So you touched upon something that I thought was really important, particularly in in, um, in this bill, and that's how it's going to how it'll ultimately harm trans students. <clears throat> and I think there's a way that it's going to harm in a very similar. In, in this kind of touches back on HB one. So let me go ahead and pull this uh, this next segment up here. <clears throat> so it says, a government entity. Any licensing or crediting organization or any athletic association organization may not entertain a complaint, open investigation, or take any other adverse action against any school or public post-secondary institution for maintaining separate interest interscholastic in uh, intercollegiate intramural or club athletic teams or sports for students of the female sex. Then it goes on to say, any student who is deprived, and this is, the, this is the key here, of an athletic opportunity or suffers any direct or indirect harm as a result of a violation of this section shall have a private cause of action for injunctive release, relief, damages, and any other relief available under law against the school or public post-secondary institution. So basically what we're doing here, folks, is we are creating more incentive, okay? So here's what I want <clears throat> to, I really want to focus on the dramatic representation, the overdramatic representation of this particular bill. We can argue, it's, I think it's fine to argue, hey, is gender a social construct? What, you know, what does it mean to be a male? What does it mean to be a female? Um, are they bi biologically rooted? I think those arguments are fine to have, and we should have those, and we should have them in a really meaningful way. We should really dig in and find out what the evidence says, okay? When it comes to the bills, we need to be very, very careful, and I think that by framing this as uh, something that it isn't, by framing it as schools inspecting genitals, framing it as sexual assault, I think what's going to happen is because the trans community is a relatively small community. I think that right now they're still working on building their support in the community in general. So I think there's a lot of hesitant people out there. And I think what you're going to find is that a lot of those hesitant people will ultimately start looking at some of these claims and saying, well, that's not really what a bill like this is doing. And so they'll be more supportive of it. And if people were supportive enough of this bill, then it would get passed. So here's where I'm going with all that. In the part that I just read, we gave incentive now to schools, basically schools to say, you know what, we're going to go out of our way to make sure that we're not violating anybody's rights because we don't want to be held civilly liable. And we just talked in HB1 about when you put somebody in a position to be civilly liable or liable for something, they're going to generally go out of their way to protect themselves. So what might going out of their way and protecting themselves in this particular case with this particular bill, what might it look like? Well, here's how it might look. You might have a school or a team that just says, look, everybody has to come, has to go and have this particular examination. We'll just call it the, um, we'll call it the, uh, the, the, the biological examination, right? We'll, we'll give, that's the name we're going to give it for this purpose. Just call it a physical exam because uh, honestly, th there's nothing additional to that. <clears throat> physical okay. exam is a, a biological origin. Right. So you're going to know male or female. Nothing's changed. Gotcha. So, so then what happens is, um, and, it, and it has to explicitly state whether you are biologically male or female according to this 
uh, according to this law. So every so everybody on everybody that wants to try out for the team has to go and get that physical. That that information comes back to the school. So now what's happened is rather than a single student maybe arguing and maybe trying to figure out where where they belong or where we want them or don't want them, right? Now every single student has to go get it. So now the arguments that hey, this is against trans students. This is uh, this is pointing. Uh, th this is highlighting trans students, uh, you know, or picking on them, is a lot less weak or a lot less strong. It's it's weaker now because now everybody has to go and do it, right? It's 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 it's, it's everybody's doing it. So now we're not pointing out and saying, oh, we think you might be trans, right? And since everybody's going to have this physical, now everybody's information is being given to the school. So imagine that you're a student and maybe you're a trans student and maybe people don't know yet, right? Or whatever. Um, you know, maybe, maybe there's, I, I don't know the trans community, I don't, but I'm assuming that there'll be a situation where somebody is maybe not fully out yet. But this is going to now put that information into the hands of the school. So that's that's my first big issue with that, is that it creates this incentive um, to, to, to basically have everybody's information put into the hands of the school. And so now, if I don't make the team, then that information is readily there students all the time work for coaches and in different offices and come across information that information could come out and be like hey they had a physical examination turns out they're really a dude or they're really a chick right that's how teens will phrase it right right so this so to me this is dangerous because now what we're doing is we're giving the schools a little bit more information about a student's health or not health but about a student's uh, medical disposition that may not necessarily be needed. And I agree with Josh, in a free market, this could be resolved, simply. You know, how could it be resolved? I don't really know exactly, because we don't have one there. We don't, we don't, it's, it's not in existence, you know? So I think that, it, I think that we're doing, you know, ultimately my issue with this bill is, and this is the issue that I think that advocates or, you know, opponents of the bill or advocates of trans students, this is where I think they should line with, align themselves with me and say, look, it's simply not the role of government to partake in these particular activities. It is not your job to ensure that young ladies or young men, uh, again, however we're defining it, it's not your job to see to it that they have future opportunities by being able to display some sort of skill in a particular area, right, of a sports area, un, you know, unrelated to education. I think that's the better argument to be having. I think it's also disingenuous and harmful to say things that aren't so. So to call this bill, you know, like we're inspecting genitals by the school. No, you're not. And when people hear that and then they see the information, they're not stupid. And they're more likely going to just write you off and say, okay, you're just exaggerating. And this bill has a little bit stronger chance of being passed. And then I think if it were passed, I think that there's going to be some potential downside to it because now all this information is being given to the school and that's not information that I think is, belongs to the school. I know that I, you, you probably already give it anyway, like, you know, hey, I want to register Johnny. Okay, is Johnny a boy or a girl? He's a boy, blah, blah, blah. So I get that they have that, but that's self-identifying effectively. That's me identifying it. I don't think it's the school's job to have medical, you know, any more medical information than they absolutely, again, have to have. Josh, what say you? Um, I, for clarity. I, I completely agree with you. I mean, I, I wish this wasn't a conversation that was involving the state. Okay, I, I, we can forego a lot of issues right there. So far as all this stuff goes, this they they already have this. Okay, they they have your medical records. They have uh, you have to to attend public school here in Florida. You have to get a physical. Right. Okay. Um, and a physical encompasses a. a you know, I've given them there. It's an assessment of body systems, right. right? Your body systems are predicated upon your biological sex. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's an algorithm marker. You go down. I mean, you, you don't, we don't give boys mammograms for a reason. Mm -hmm. Well, we probably should. Breast cancer does happen in men. It does. You know, uh, my grandfather actually had breast cancer, but um, the thing is, uh, DL, 
I don't, I don't know what the intent, like I keep going back to this. I don't know what the intent is because to be honest with you, what needs to happen in my opinion with this whole discussion is the transgender movement. And this is what tells me it's political. The transgender movement needs to decouple from the idea that this must be, that transgenderism must be tied to uh, biology for it to be a valid existence for them. Correct. Okay. That is the underpinning of this entire problem. Um, your, your view of your persona, your belief, the way you feel is valid. Okay. How you feel is an absolutely valid thing. You don't need to tie that into some other because you feel like a, um, a male or you feel like a woman. You don't need to have that validated by biological markers. Right. What I'm seeing in literature and what I'm seeing in politics to an extent is they are trying their best to muddy the significance of biology um, to justify their exist the existence or to justify it. The justification is not needed. You don't need to justify it. But where you're getting the resistance is when you come tell people uh, and, and, and someone like me who will listen uh, and I'm a healthcare provider. Or, or you're talking to the general public, whoever, mm -hmm. whenever you're trying to tell them that it is predicated upon a biological phenomenon, and if you um, don't believe that, then you're homophobic or right. you're, you're something. And that's causing a division. And what that's doing is now we're, now we're moving into, into, into schools, which it shouldn't necessarily be there. But Earlier, I mentioned you don't have the right to per, of projection, right? Mm -hmm. If they would, if the, the idea of transgenderism would be decoupled as being just a lifestyle choice, um, and it just reflect that and not be tied into a biological component, we wouldn't have that. Would, this, this wouldn't be a discussion. But what we're trying to say is, is like biology is null and void. It doesn't really right. matter. It's how you feel. And next thing you know, we've got 240 pound uh, six foot two men, uh, competing in, you know, Olympic powerlifting, you, you know, it, it's, it, it really kind of defies logic, you know, and to me, I think that if you tie uh, a person's existence, so you have someone who is mentally, um, they are not, uh, a high functioning or they're not a, a high functioning transgender individual. This is someone who truly has, gender dysmorphia they're really um really struggling with a lot of rather a lot of other ailments they now have a media circus telling them that this is tied to biology right and when when they can't find evidence of that or whenever this flips that it's not this is really going to mess with these people's paradigm and people who don't work with these uh type of patients you don't see that you don't understand okay. what this does to people um there's nothing wrong with saying this is a construct. There's nothing wrong with saying it. It's like, it's like you like country music. Oh, you like to wear camouflage and you like to uh, wear boots and stuff. And that's your personality and your persona. It's a construct. There's nothing wrong with it. I didn't need to look for a genetic marker to determine your, uh, you feel country. Um, right. You know, it's subjective and there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And the conflation into the biological is the one causing the problems. Lastly, the schools, like I said, they already have this information. They're being hyperbolic about it. Uh, these groups, Pink and all other kinds of different groups. The Miami New Times I've got right here. Advocates Save Florida's. This is literally the opposite of what I said. You can't even see it. Um, yeah. Florida's uh, transgender, the, 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 the heading says, Advocates Save Florida's transgender student athlete ban will harm trans kids. I could like I could sit here and write a book as to why it's actually just the opposite. And I could put I could put zero opinions in it. It could be just a completely scientific paper. But that's the problem, DL, because we're getting called transphobe. There's not a good faith, honest conversation taking place. And these waters are only going to get more muddied. And to make matters worse, we go back to our original complaint with this. The state's involved. <laughs> right. So do right. you think the state is going to provide clarity? And a in a uh, complex cultural issue, right? 
Well, I Negative. think that's the. I think that's <laughs> what we need to focus on here. So maybe you're watching and you're saying, "Hey, you know what? I really disagree with Josh, and I've read way more literature than him, and he's totally wrong." That's fine. I get that. Okay. And 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 I know that there are some people out there that will that would say that. The oh, there's a lot point, of people, there, there's a lot of people out there right. that say the, um, and, that that's that's my thing. They're wrong. Right. And it's, well, and, and that's it's fine. Not, it's not a it's it's not a it's not an honest good faith discussion. Right. It's just simply not. <laughs> right. And what I'm getting at, what I'm getting at for, for me in my show here and in, in what I'm attempting to do here with this bill review is not really finalize the conversation on trans uh, the trans community and gender and sex. That's not what I'm attempting to do. I don't necessarily have very strong opinions in the same way that Josh does or yep. in the way that other people do. What I do is I look at it and I say, I think that there are problems by starting to add this into legislation. And the biggest problem is that one, while we're having this debate, which I think is a debate that's worth having, you know, and whether or not we're having it, honestly, that's, a, that's its own issue. While we're having this debate, when we start putting it into legislation, what it ends up being is a whole lot less figuring things out and a whole lot more fighting for power. And when we're fighting for power, there is a loser. And that loser, it, it's, it's much different than saying, hey, we've worked this out. We're, we, we, you know, we only need the, the, base, the most basic of laws, but we've otherwise got it worked out socially. Right. So, for instance, marriage, just 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 take hetero standard hetero I mean, marriage between two people that are heterosexual. Right. That's already been worked out. We got it figured out for the most part. I mean, you've got some people that are like, hey, I'm polyamorous. And then you've got some people that might say, you know, I think I might want to marry my cat. Um, and then you've got, you know, people that would say, hey, like, well, I'm I'm of a different, you know, I'm, I'm want to marry somebody of the same sex, you know. Uh, and I'm not necessarily equating all of them. I'm just saying that these are out there, right? But we've already got the idea of marriage kind of worked out in a sense. And so now we're, we're, you know, any fight that we're having is more about the details of it, right? Imagine if the idea of marriage in itself were relatively new and we're having that debate and we're trying to legislate it. I think that's kind of where we are with this because for a lot of people, the idea of a trans person is quite new to them. This is not an idea that they grew up hearing about and knowing about. So it's very, very new to them. It would be the very, it'd be the equivalent of saying, hey, these two people are going to come together in a bond and they're probably going to be, uh, you know, only doing certain things with, with, each other and nobody else, right? They'll only have intimacy with themselves, nobody else. And somebody's saying, wow, that's a really weird concept. Like I've never heard of that before, you know? So we wanna be careful when we start legislating things because when you legislate things, especially things that aren't really worked out, they may be worked out in your mind, whatever position that you're taking, but they're not worked out socially. And when we, when we start legislating for that, you start creating losers and if you're technically on the side that should be winning and you're not, things could get worse for you. So this is where I'm coming from. This is why I oppose this bill. You know, now Josh uh, supports the bill, I believe he said earlier, for different reasons, that's fine. And, and I think this is, these are things that we need to have these discussions on. So uh, with that, Josh, do you have anything more on this bill or should we dive right um, into 937? Uh, sorry. Um... I um I do want to close with one thing on that. Sure. Um, you know, I, I completely understand what you're saying with uh, you know, not finalizing the conversation or whatnot. You know, that that's already started. If this is not put in place, mm -hmm. uh, the public discourse and public education is going to move this to where it's finalizing it in the other direction. My argument is losing. Okay. I, I I'm on the losing end here. Right. I will get ostracized. Enough people hear this. I'll get called transphobe. If people could dox me and hurt me financially somehow, they'd probably try it. I have actually had people try to do that, you know, which is a terrible mm -hmm. shame because I'm, I'm an objective clinician. I'm not emotional about this at all. If people would give me 20 minutes to listen. The, the, the fight is already being lost. And th this is a challenge over science at this point in time. And if this, if this kind of 
process doesn't start taking place. I, I, like I said, I don't know what the end point is here, but mm -hmm. biological sex does matter. Mm -hmm. And as far as the mm -hmm. government is concerned, that needs to be their line. Let society figure out the social issues, but if the government is involved, male, female, it matters. That, that, that's, and I, I, feel, I do feel pretty strong about that. We, we, can't start, we can't start partitioning out biological sex into 1,800 different things. There's gender identities. You can have all the different identities that you want. They're still equally valid, but let's not conflate this with biology because you're, it's not a good road to go on. So like I, I, I support, I, let, me, let me just say this. I, I, um, uh, I support it with severe re reservation. I wish we didn't even have to be in this spot. But I don't want the conversation about biological sex to just start going by the wayside, because to be quite frank right now, our last bastion of protecting this notion uh, is, is residing in our public schools, in our current infrastructure. We let that go by the wayside. Uh, it's going to finish uh, becoming pervasive all the way up through our grad schools. You're going to see it show up more and more in, uh, in our medical sciences, which are already getting hyper politicized. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when medical sciences become hyper politicized, errors uh, and all kinds of other bad things happen. Um, and literally, it could it could it could derail science for decades. Similar type things uh, of other natures have happened all throughout history of, with, with the medical profession. Some some kind of social taboo or social thing comes up. It eventually circles all the way back around back to science, anyways. Gotcha. So. so the good thing about science is is you got scientific. Uh, the scientific method you could test things right mm -hmm. I, I can test biological sex repeatedly repetitively um if you do a uh, uh one of those and, and it's the same consistent answer your entire life right same consistent answer your entire life if you do the gender fluidity uh scale i can't remember the name of it you might know we talked about it before you will not be the same year to year it's fluid so that has to be concrete, you know, and, and, and disputing right. that at this point in time, like, like I said, the fight, my argument is losing. My argument absolutely is, is losing and it's not losing because of anything justified. So I I'm, I'm going to, I, I'm going to support this. I'm going to support this bill, even though I wish the state had nothing to do with this. I would abolish gotcha. public education tomorrow if you gave it to me, but I, I don't have that ability. So uh, the only thing I could do in the meantime is speak honestly and objectively about the science behind all this and say that you're doing more harm than good. So there you have it, folks. Yeah. yeah. All right. Now we need to move on to the last bill that we've mentioned a couple of times in when we were reviewing HB1. And that's going to be uh, U.S. Senate Bill 937, 937. And that's going to be the COVID-19 um, <coughs> Act. So let's go ahead and pull that up on the screen so we can read a little bit about what this bill is doing here. So there we have it. All right. So this particular bill, it says the following the spread of COVID-19 in 2020, there has been a dramatic increase in hate crimes and violence against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. According to a recent report, there were nearly 3,800 reported cases of anti-Asian discrimination and incidents related to COVID-19 between March 19, 2020 and February 28, 2020, uh, 2021 in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. So that's what this bill is doing. And effectively what we've got is, <clears throat> excuse me, a bill that is uh, looking to say, hey, there are uh, 3,800, uh, there are 3,800 crimes uh, that have been committed in this particular year span. And it points out a few things. So I want to, let's see here. Excuse me. Um, oh, yeah, I remember where I wanted to go. So the report, we can we can actually pull up that report. It's from Stop AAI, AAPI Hate. Um, you can go to stopaapihate.com and you can look up their report. So let me go ahead and pull up that report really quickly for you. And when we pull up that report, let's take a look and see some of the things that it has in here. And we'll get a sense of what this particular uh, what this particular bill is basing its information on. So let me go ahead and pull that up here in just a minute. <coughs> 
and let's see here. A lot of clicking. Gonna have to work on getting this clicking <coughs> down. It's okay. All right, transition. Bam! There we go. Now we have the types of discrimination. So we see the verbal harassment and name calling represents sixty-eight point one percent. We see that avoidance and shunning is twenty point five percent. Physical assault is eleven point one percent. Other is uh you know is now we're getting into the single digits so we've got like 8.4 and 7 percent now for coughed at and spat upon online 6.3 percent so what i want to do is i want to read a couple of the um reports so the way that this organization operates is that people will send information in and say hey here's what happened to me and then they collect all these reports now do they verify them i don't know that they can necessarily you'll see why in just a moment that some of these are hard to uh they would be very difficult to actually verify that they happen so we're gonna it's kind of on the honor roll and i assume that people that are taking the time out of their day to go and say hey this particular event happened to be i'm going to assume that the greater majority of them are being honest that they actually did happen and they happened pretty much mostly in the way that people remember so i'm not really disputing that these happen i'm not really disputing the numbers here okay they say 3795 i'm going to go with it i think that's fine now when we're looking at the percentages if you add them up you get more than 100 percent i don't know this specifically because i don't have their actual data set but what i assume is happening is that some incidents will actually overlap and fit into more than one category and so then when they do their counts, they basically add them up and they say, okay, well, we've got 68% here and then 20% and 11%. And then you keep adding it and it ends up becoming more than 100%. So I think that's what's happening. So let's scroll down here a little bit and we'll get to a couple of their stories. So we've got one here, we've got under verbal harassment. So we'll read the top one. It just says, I was shopping at um, whatever store in Milpitas when an older man started making faces at me, <laughs> I asked him, what was wrong? And he said, well, what's wrong? You're out here shopping. Strangely enough, by the way, apparently the man was too. I was confused. And he followed up with, we delisted your companies, shipped back your international students. When do you ship out? When do you ship out? We're going to take away your citizenship. Okay. So this was in, um, I believe I'm saying this correctly, Milpitas, California. So let's go ahead and we'll read another one. We'll read, uh, let's go ahead and read the physical assault here. Very first one. My boyfriend and I were riding the metro into D.C. When on the escalator in the transfer station, a man repeatedly punched my back and pushed past us. At the top, he circled back toward us, followed us, repeatedly shouting, Chinese bitch. I <coughs> mean, fake coughed, like what Josh is doing. Josh is doing a real cough. Fake <clears throat> coughed at and physically threatened us. A few days later, we saw a news story about the owner of a, a, a Valley Brook Tea in D.C., was harassed and pepper sprayed by the same man call who had called him COVID-19 repeatedly. And that was in Annadale, uh, Virginia. And then under avoidance and shunning, we see, I came into the coffee shop at Mercado and people started leaving the area where I sat one by one. People started coming in and they sat on the other side at the coffee shop and uh, away from me. I became isolated on one side of the coffee shop. That was here in Florida, in Naples. Okay, so we, we see that there are some incidents here. We get a good idea of the type of incidents that are being presented to people. So because of all of this, and because my wife is from Indonesia and my son is visibly Asian, I had a particular interest in this bill because I wanted to see like, okay, what's going on here? Is there a huge concern for us? And because if there is, I'm gonna need to, uh, I'm gonna need to, to, to take some action in some case and maybe even support the bill. But here's the thing. That people, uh, that people are acting behave, you know, that people are, that these stories are examples of foul behavior for sure. We should never accept them. This is unacceptable. I, I, this, if my son were doing this to somebody, I would have words to say about him uh, or to him, right? And if we look and we say, hey, that these events have happened and people didn't say anything, that's awful and that's its own problem. That's another problem it's, itself. I really despise the idea of people just sitting by letting these kind of things happen. But the bill is giving me some red flags because it's drafted on the basis of this report where 80, roughly 80%, 80 percent, 88 to you know 90 maybe percent of the incidents were people that were just acting terrible, calling people names, saying horrible things to them, not sitting ne next to them. Those are not crimes, nor should we see them as such. 
Punching someone's back, however, <clears throat> fake coughing at them, pandemic or not, and physically threatening them, those are acts of aggression. Those yes. made up about 11%. So the question that I have immediately is, well, is there this dramatic increase in crime that I keep hearing about? And, um, and, and, and so that's the question that we have, because whenever we're looking at a bill, the first thing that we need to look at, we need to, we need to determine, hey, is there reason that we need to implement this legislation? Because all legislation is by force, okay? You talk to any libertarian, they're gonna tell you, legislation happens through force. Mm -hmm. You know, it, and, and the force could come all the way yes. up to shooting somebody, deadly force, right? This is, you may have seen the meme, and I don't have it readily available, but there's a meme out there where it shows like a man getting pulled over by an officer and he gets a speeding ticket. And then he puts the speeding ticket in the uh, glove compartment. He forgets about it. Then he gets a, a warrant out for his arrest. He gets arrested. Um, he maybe fights the arrest or whatever. And then he gets shot, something like that. And it's, it basically outlines this progression where one thing could lead to another. Because ultimately what happens is the fact that an officer pulls me over, um, he pulls me over through threat of force. He, mm -hmm. offer, he gives me a ticket through threat of force. I pay that ticket through threat of force. I pay it and I comply because I don't want the level of force necessary that's going to force me to do these things, okay? So when we're implementing an, any law, we want to make sure that, hey, why are we doing it? Is there a need there? So I'm already kind of red, you know, I've kind of, I've kind of got the red flags thrown up saying, I don't know. I don't know if there's really a need to it. Okay. Um, the driver of this is, of course, just the report from Stop AAIP. Uh, AA, uh, AAPI, I'm sorry, AAPI. It's a big yeah. Um, it's, you know, in, in there's... I have questions about their report, but only in the context of promoting government involvement. Okay, let's put mm -hmm. it that way. So now the question is, what about the rest of the bill though? Maybe the rest of the bill itself has value for the roughly 900 some incidents that I would agree do warrant some sort of potential government attention. When I say government attention, I'm talking about the acts of actual aggression. So punching somebody, fake coughing at them, uh, you, you know, you know, threatening them in some way. So what we need to do is we need to read the section on findings that the bill goes on uh, to state and see uh, some of the other things. And in there, we find that it says that race is cited as the primary reason for discrimination, making up over 90% of all the incidents, and that 36% of them took place at a business. So they're very, very public. And um, so, so there may be some, some warrant here, okay? Before I continue on, though, I do want to I do want to point out a couple of things. It's called the COVID nineteen Hate Crimes Act, and it uses information from Stop AAPI as uh, hate. Uh, <laughs> that is very tough for me to say. Stop AAPI hate as its basis, and both of these are going to be relevant in just a moment. So before I read section five, which is where the bill really kind of kicks off what, what it does, Josh, do you got any comments on this? Um, I, I don't know to the, I, just real quick, I, I'll say, cause I want you to get through in section five, the, that's the uh, Jabara hire part, right? The no hate act. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, I, I don't, I don't know personally that it's, it's like the, the rates have gone up. I have asked some of my friends that, uh, uh, work with the general population uh, that are of Asian ethnicity that uh, being a pharmacist, obviously we encounter thousands of people a day. Mm -hmm. um, there does seem to be uh, some, some things, uh, especially since COVID started up, uh, all of them said that people have uh, at times uh, said rude comments, uh, no physical assaults, uh, anybody personally that I know. Right. But uh, the amount of, uh, at least from them that they're telling me the amount of comments said to them derogatory, uh, you know, after COVID uh, ha has gone up, at least from the people I know. So uh, th there is an issue, but like I said, I, I, don't, I don't know that necessarily we need to have the law involved with um, the people being buttheads. Right. I almost, right. I almost used another word there, but I remembered <laughs> family friendly. Gotcha. We try to keep it. Yeah, I we don't try use to keep the word. I don't use the word butthead. Sure, <laughs> but, sure, you know, yeah, absolutely. That, that was a that was a quick detour. Um, 
it doesn't mean that I don't find it problematic. I, I think treating anybody um, different because of an attribute uh, is is wrong. Uh, okay, right. and you know if if you have happen to be Asian, uh, happen to be white or black or whatever, any attribute, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with who you are. Uh, if you treat somebody differently because of that, you're you're wrong. Right. Uh, you know, so, um, but no, go ahead, go ahead and go on. I go, cover the the uh, Jabara Hire Act, and then we'll go from there. Okay, so inside of this, it has the <laughs> Jabara Hire Act, and. The, uh, it was named after um, a, a man, uh, trying to remember his name at the moment, I don't have it, uh, Khalid, I think. Khalid, Khalid Jabara. Jabara. And he was attacked and viciously, viciously beaten by his neighbor, and then uh, he was killed. And then you had Heather Heyer, who was killed in the Unite the Right rally out in Charlottesville when that, uh, I don't remember the guy's name, but the driver you know, ran through the crowd and he ended up killing Heather Heyer. So it's named yeah. after those two, those two individuals. So here's what it says. The incidents of violence known as hate crimes or crimes motivated by bias poses a serious national problem. According to data obtained by Federal Bureau of Investigation, the incidence of such violence increased in 2019, the most recent year for which data is available. So then we continue on and we go down a little bit here. And it says, a more complete understanding of the national problem posed by hate crime is in the public interest and supports the federal interest in eradicating bias-motivated violence referred, uh, referenced in Section 249B1C of Title 18 United States Code. However, a complete understanding of the national problem posed by hate crimes is hindered by incomplete data from federal, state, and local jurisdiction through the Uniform Crime Reports Program, authorized under Section 534 of Title 28 United States Code and administered by the Federal Bureau, uh, the, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI. So basically what we've got here, folks, is that I feel like there's a, conf there's a conflict here. So on one hand, it starts out and it says, all right, look, hate crimes have went up between 2020 and 2021, and they're using information from stopaapihate.org and their collection of information. And they're saying that they went up between 2020 and, 20, uh, 2020 and 2021. And here's the problem though. First of all, I look and I, I look at the data, uh, just a kind of a quick overview, and I say, hey, it looks like some of this stuff is not actually a hate crime. So that's a problem in itself. It's not a crime. I'm sorry, not a hate crime, but it's not a crime. It's not a crime, period. It's not that it's not a hate crime. It's not a crime, period. Calling somebody some names is not a crime. Again, nor should it be. Okay, shunning somebody, not sitting next to them, also not a crime. So it's it's initiating this bill by saying, hey, crime has went up when some of those things have been conflated. But then we get here to this other section, and it says that uh, that we don't have information uh, the only information that the government has that it's been collecting is from 2019. And then it says oh, that a more complete understanding of the national problem that's posed by hate crime is needed and that we need to, uh, in order to have a complete understanding of the problem, that we need, um, you know, we, we, we have incomplete data in this program called the Uniform Crime Reports Program. So, if you're not seeing this already, let me be very, very clear what we've got going on. This is saying crime has went up, but we don't have a complete data set. We need to look into it more in order for us to be able to tell you how much of a problem it is for us. So it's kind of talking out of both sides of the mouth. And it's kind of presenting this picture that is inaccurate because it's saying, Again, we, we said 3,800. I was interested in that. And I said, okay, well, let's take a look. And then I said, well, it looks like only about 900 of those are actually a problem. But what I don't know is of that 900, of the things that I would say are actually a crime, how many happened in years prior? Was there 800? Was there 900? Was there 1,000? Did it maybe go down in that particular area, in, in the particular area of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders? You know, maybe there was other hate crime that occurred with different groups that has that has went up. What does the 2019 data look like? I don't know, right? So this is this is the problem that I'm already having with this bill is because it's presenting this narrative on information that's already conflicting its own information. Okay, mm -hmm. Josh, you got some words on this yet? 
Uh, yeah, actually, uh, just All what right, you said again. They, they said that they are, they were short, uh, really of information, right? They're saying mm-hmm. we, we need more information. <clears throat> uh, now, it, it's easy to say that statistics have gone up on something when you have increased the um, the definitions of what that is, right? It's like right. you were saying that there's not all those things are crimes. Keep in mind at the beginning of this, I did say that people from personal experience had said that things are going up. So obviously there is a, a social issue, uh, which I, we could probably tie back into COVID. You get right. a percentage of the population that becomes a little bit hyper and they try to blame a group of people for something because they, they look like uh, or they think they look like somebody who was guilty of it. Um, you know, right after 9-11, obviously, you saw people who came from the Middle East. I mean, for a while, everybody was terrorist, right? That's how they treated right. people. Right. Um, it's unfortunate because all of this is a symptom of collectivism because we don't look at each other as individuals. So you see someone that, that's Asian and you hear your president going, China, China virus, and, you know, blaming, you know, right. uh, what appears to be at least Chinese people for it. Uh, you know, you get the the ignorant, unwashed masses that come out and they blame the first Asian looking person that they see on the street. Right. Um, it's terrible. So there's nothing wrong with that. But even in the, in the bill in, the, in the section seven, there, it says the problem of crimes motivated by bias is sufficiently serious, widespread and interstate in nature as to warrant federal financial assistance to states and local jurisdictions. Right. There's right. another one of your contradictory things that is definitive as like, we have the data and it's yeah. sufficiently serious to, Give financial resources. Right. So hey, what uh, are those financial people- resources go toward? Well, if yeah. you heard me correctly, I said something called the Uniform Crime Reports Program. So and I'm not gonna I don't have the rest of it highlighted. We'll just talk about it in general. So what this bill actually does is it kind of sets the stage and says, Hey, look, you see all these reports over here? They're out of hand. People are really hating on Asian people and Pacific Islanders. But then it goes along and says, yeah, but we don't really have a good handle on the information uh, that we need to determine the level of problem that hate crimes pose in the United States. And then, as you point out, it says, hey, but, you know, it's interstate. Um, Anytime you hear interstate, get your eyes open because that means something's about to happen. So then they go and they make a definitive statement and say, hey, there's definitely this problem and it definitely warrants federal in, in, you know, information. So then it goes along and it says, starts promoting this Uniform Crime Report, Reports program. So what they've identified is they said, look, it's incomplete at the federal level and we definitely don't have in, in information at the state and local level. So what it does is it says, we're going to set up this program where we're gonna incentivize states to use it and we're gonna offer them money if they self-report to the Uniform Crime Reports Program. And we're going to allow them to offer that money to their local uh, municipalities. So the state of Florida could say, all right, well, Duval, which is the county that I live in, they can say, all right, Duval, you can have some of this money here if you will report um, hate crimes into this Uniform Crime Reports Program, this national database. And we're going to do that as well. So we're all going to we're going to get together. So you're going to get some money because we're getting money from the federal government. Um, and that's incentive to, uh, you know, we're, we're, the money is incentive if we will participate in this particular program. So if you remember, folks, back in HB1, I said that there was an incentive <coughs> to increase money for the law enforcement community. Well, guess what? This bill also also authorizes local jurisdictions to take that money and fund law enforcement. So putting things together, and it's not very clear. It's not like this bill is saying, hey, by the way, it turns out we realize that HB1 is in existence and we want to work in tandem with it. What I'm doing is I'm reading between the lines a little bit here, and I don't generally like to read between the lines, but I think it's fair at this particular moment to say these two bills work hand in hand with each other because you have HB1 that says, hey, you cannot reduce funding for the police and we're going to incentivize you to increase funding. Well, where does that money going to come from? Maybe it comes from the citizens. Maybe it comes from the state. And where's the money? Where's the state going to get the money? Well, the state can get it from the federal government through this Uniform Crime Reports program. So now we're starting to see what this bill really does. It just expands a reporting program at the federal level. 
It's not mm-hmm. necessarily actually addressing crime. If you read through it, you're not going to see that they they don't offer any additional penalties. All they do is they take stop AAPI's <laughs> report and they use that as the foundation, kind of like a, 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 a you know to get the door open, and then mm-hmm. to say, well, we've got to do something. What is that something? We've got to collect more information. How do we collect more information? We're going to give people money, right? As basically, I mean, it really boils down to being that simple. All right, Josh, what do you got? Um, I'm going to start with failure to comply. Uh, this is if you fail, fail to comply with, if you've taken this money, mm-hmm. uh, so you're a local municipality, a state, whatever. If a state or unit of local government that receives a grant fails to substantially comply with paragraph A, uh, the state or local uh, government shall repay the grant in full plus reasonable interest and penalty charges allowable by law established by the attorney right. general. So not only are they giving them incentive to do this, if they don't do it, they're going to be in a world of hurt. OK, right. So once they get in, so once they've accepted this money, here's how this goes. You and I know this because this is how all federal programs work their way into the states. It's really in cities. Right. right? Um, you know, they, they trade money for power. Right. Uh, they trade money for sovereignty. You, you know, states' rights are very, very small right at this point uh, in time anyways. Um, with the police forces already, uh, we're already seeing a federalization of them through the uh, the Joint Terrorism Task Force and all, all of those types of things that they do. That, that's how they get all that military surplus equipment. There's, there's, uh, there's strings attached to everything, right? Correct. So uh, you, you have this process where they're trying to expand this reporting uh, thing now these aren't these aren't uh, crimes like you said, but they're going to start collecting data uh, as to all these supposed hate crimes that are going on. So what I see now obviously I don't know the full extent of where this is going to go. Right, just like you said right off the bat, I see it as a way to increase funding or to at the very least maintain a level of funding for the police. So it doesn't actually address any uh, crimes per se. Right. But now that they're creating this <clears throat> network. All the way down to your local municipal level from the federal, you know, federal all the way down to your local group. Uh, taking a let's just say a barometer or a uh, measurement of the local speech, I, you know, once again, we're getting really close to free speech. Now, is it is it um, is it wrong of me uh, or wrong of anyone to 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 hurl insults at someone uh, and use a. Um, an attribute in in that insult? Yes. Should that ever be criminal? No. no Correct. I, I, it shouldn't be. What What's concerning to me with this and any number of other bills, several that we've talked about, I'm very concerned that we're looking at the slow process of a complete federalization of the police forces. Right. Uh, there, there's a lot of progressives on the left. And, you know, let, let's not kid ourselves here. There's a lot of Republicans who would like to see a federalization of the police force. Right. All right. You know, McCain would have loved to have seen that. I know Cheney, right. Liz Cheney would love to see that. Um, now, they're not going to come out and tell you that. The right. thing is, you build these kind of things in stages. Right. And the first thing you have to do, the first thing you have to do is you have to build the scaffolding. You have to have the infrastructure there. Now, when it comes to policing and stuff, the infrastructure is information exchange. You have to have the networks for information mm-hmm. exchange. Right. This is putting the federal government in your local sheriff's office and even putting the federal government in your local um, police department, like your city police departments. Now, they right. already are there for quite a, quite a number of things, quite a number of things they already are there. But now we're getting into the realm of speech, even more so than it already was under the um, uh, hate crimes provision of the uh, Civil Rights Act. So, uh, you know, this is I, I don't like the direction that this is going. Um, and you know what really upsets me the most about it? Uh, and I, I know you feel stronger about this than I do, because like you said, you know, uh, your wife, uh, your wife's ethnicity and obviously um, uh, Liberty Sun. Um, how does this help? How does this actually help them? Right. And, you know, and that's the problem, folks. It, does. does this it doesn't help them. It, it doesn't help them. What, what I see it does, it, it, it does, it, is it starts building the infrastructure of a system uh, that can institutionalize hate crimes Mm -hmm. uh that's what i see and uh you know and keep in mind this is all coming from a federal government that has never truly uh addressed the fact that we had japanese japanese internment camps right 
So I, I just need to point that out because we talk, we talk about hate crimes and you start talking about giving central authority to something. Uh, I don't like the direction this is going and it doesn't actually help our, uh, our fellow American citizens who happen to have this type of ethnicity. Right. All it does is collect more information yeah. and it uses the idea that um, things are on the rise, but it, it also acknowledges that it doesn't really know that things are on the rise. It's just kind of making an assumption. Yeah. Um, but in, in, and there's something to be said. What Like, look, when somebody is funding something, the reality is they get a lot of say in what you're doing. If oh, I... Yeah. Well, the program could change. That's that's the thing, too. Once you've taken that funding, they've done this with the Joint Terrorism Task Force. Once they've taken that funding and they've got that MRAP, uh, the terms and conditions, you know, the little fine print at the bottom, that stuff stuff changes, right? All the time, all the time. And and you don't have a say on it on the local level. Once you've established that connection, you know, the prime example of that would be your interstates. I'll let people look that up on their own. But once that line is signed, you're done. You now right. have forfeited uh, your sovereignty on another level. Right. So, so you know, so yeah. imagine it like this, folks. Imagine now city of Jacksonville decides that they want to get some additional funding for the police force. And let's just say that nobody has a problem with it, right? Let's just say that, you know, the majority of the people in this city say, you know what, that's a good idea. We think that we should have some more police force. Maybe they, they should have some more equipment. And so the law enforcement looks and they say, hey, it looks like there's a federal grant that could roll its way down. Um, and all we got to do is participate in this uniform uh, crime reporting program. And so, yeah, we'll totally do that and we'll get some money, right? So then they get their additional monies. And so then we say, okay, well, you know what? We're, we're done reporting to that program. We think we've done. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and cut ties with that program, which is what? It's defunding the police. Right. So then somebody later says, whoa, 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 you can't defund the police because there's a bill that says you're, you know, if you do, uh, I can raise an issue and take it to the state. And I think that there's some more hate crimes that need to be reported here or whatever the case may be. Right. So now so now locally, we're kind of, uh, you know, on the hook to stay in this program. If we want to continue getting the funds, the federal government later could say, you know what? Now that everybody's using this program, we actually want to shift gears a little bit. We want to do something a little different. In order for you to continue receiving this money, you are uh, you're going to have to participate in this particular matter. Now you're going to have to do this, right? Whatever this is, it doesn't matter. It could be good, it could be bad, it could be somewhere in between, right? It's hard to say. Don't know. And that's the problem. The problem is it becomes a way for control. Now, do I think this is some insidious? thing that's been that's happened because somebody sat down and plotted it no actually i don't i think this is just the nature of things right Mm -hmm. this is what happens people start putting somebody has money you know however they acquired it they have money and they give it to somebody else they want something in return period and their their uh, their demands may change on what they want in return where do we see this happen all the time in the workplace I go to work, my boss is like, all right, you're gonna have to generate all these TPS reports. Okay, great. And then later his boss says, you know what? I want these other reports. I, you know, I want these TPS plus reports, but I want the TPS ones as well. So then he tells his, you know, he tells my boss and my boss tells me and says, all right, DL, now you have to not only print out and have the TPS reports ready, you have to have the TPS plus reports ready. And that is the condition under which we will continue employing you. Otherwise, if you do not do that, we will have to let you go because we are paying you. So we're going to decide exactly under what conditions that we're going to give you this money. The same thing happens with the government. And that's what that's what I see happening, happening here. So I take this and I look and I say, well, what's the scary way? What's what's the what's the speculative uh, result of this? So imagine that um, imagine that the federal funds end up depending on finding a certain number of hate crimes. And remember, we have to incentivize, we have to uh, we have to justify the the passage of this bill, the expansion of the uniform crime reports program, you know, since it's be, since we're trying to expand it to state and local reporting, right? So now we have to kind of justify it. Well, what way do we justify it? By saying, "Hey, we think there's something here." And if nothing comes of it, right? Like imagine that they say, hey, we think that uh, hate crime has been doubling in all the major cities and all the major cities come back and say, yeah, actually, it really hasn't. Well, then 
that's that that's going to be a political downfall for somebody because they're going to you know somebody's going to come back and say well you instituted this uniform crime reports um program uh nationally and through all the states and the localities and it turns out it was a dud so you wasted everybody's time and all their effort on this nobody wants that to happen so the best way to have that not happen is to say all right we know because that's what the bill is already doing the bill is already saying on one hand we know something is happening on the other hand we don't know something is happening we need to we need to find out so it's already saying both things at once so there's no reason not to believe that somebody later wouldn't say hey look we've asserted this is true you find it well if local and law enforcement needs to find crime they can certainly find crime i mean you know that's not been an argument that most people uh, dispute for quite a while so you know that's the danger that we have of this particular bill now earlier i said it's named the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act. Here's the thing. It should have been named the Uniform Crime Reports Act because that's what it actually does. It doesn't really address hate crimes that are related to COVID-19. All it does is uses this idea that they've increased as a pretext for something else, right? So it's a bait and switch in a sense. I actually kind of think it's actually slightly racist because one of the complaints that a lot of these people have, even from that one website, had to do with they were getting called coronavirus, right. COVID-19. This should be Asian hate crime bill. Instead, it's called COVID-19. Right. Are you calling Asians COVID-19? Right. I, right. I, you, you know, know it's like, like, it's like I, I was confused by that. I was like, I, I had to read this thing like three times. It's like, it, it, it didn't even say anything about COVID. <laughs> what, what is this? Right, you know? right. The, the only thing, the only relationship to COVID-19 is the time frame under which yeah, yeah. certain things were reported. Um, and then why there might have been an increase, because the idea was saying like, hey, there was an increase because people were scared of this, uh, this virus that came from China. And a lot of people got foolish and thought, okay, every time I see a Chinese person or an Asian person that who I'm who is going to be assumed to be Chinese just because they're Asian, then, you know, people would treat them differently in a negative sense. And that probably did happen. That's, that's the thing. Here's the thing. It's probably rude. There is some truth to that. Probably. I, I don't doubt that there were people out there that walked out and saw Asian people that saw maybe actual Chinese people and treated them badly because of the virus, you know, and said like, hey, it's all your fault because that kind of thing happens. People generalize. The question was whether or not there was a dramatic increase which earlier, as I pointed out, I don't think that we have evidence. There might have been, but I don't think there was evidence to support a dramatic increase. I don't think that there's any evidence at all, zero evidence that anything in this bill will address any rise, whether it's dramatic or minor. So, <clears throat> so, so all it's doing is going to put states and municipalities on the hook for engaging in a particular program that is nothing more than a reporting program. So then in five years, maybe the government will come back and say, hey, we've instituted it and now we have more information to pass yet more legislation, which I would probably disagree with since I have a habit of disagreeing with most legislation that I read. So that is all that I have. Josh, do you have anything else? Just I'll close up real quick just to clarify, you know, I said that I believe this is a, a path to federalize, federalizing the police force. Um, is that done intentionally, unintentionally? I don't know. That's That would be uh, speculation for me to say. Uh, but I said it pretty confidently because even though it may not be insidious uh, or intentional, it is a symptom of this right. condition we find ourselves in. So this is how the Leviathan gets built. Um, you don't have any, I believe all, all kind of all federal earmarks or federal programs like this should have sunset clauses. Uh, Cause once they get in, say you, your County commissioner or whoever it is, they agree to this, the money comes in. Um, it doesn't ever leave. So your next County commissioner may come in and not like this federal program or the entire electorate of the area may disagree with it now, but it's already there. Right. So I, I, once again, this, this is kind of goes back into that whole, um, uh, the philosophy of taxation without representation. Right. 
action or, or law without consent. Uh, you know, I um, I think all federal programs into states, all of them uh, should have sunsets on them. Uh, they gotcha. need to be re reauthorized and revalidated by uh, the the current state uh, state elected officials. Gotcha. But that, that's that's all I got. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed it, folks. We reviewed three bills today. I hope you were not terribly bored. I hope you found them very, very interesting. I hope you understand how bills, even when they're, you know, when they're like, say, a, a state bill and a federal bill, how they can overlap and how they can intertwine with each other. I hope it's starting to become more clear now. Um, I hope it's uh, clear why I'm disputing some of these bills and why I don't necessarily agree with them, even if I agree with some of the elements that are within the bills. But that is all for this episode. If you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button to catch Liberty Dad episodes when they air, head on over to facebook.com forward slash free speech media network where the weekly episode of Just Me airs on Monday nights at 8 p.m. I've moved from 10 p.m. to 8 p.m. So I am at 8 p.m. now. Um, and then, or join Josh Fields and I from the Liberty, Josh Fields from the Libertarian Apothecary and me on Friday night at 11 p.m. as we discuss the same uh, episode, but in a discussion style format. And while you're there, while you're over there at facebook.com forward slash free speech media network, I want you to check out some of the other free speech media shows. Lastly, if you are a champion of liberty, your business is people, and your product is liberty. Have a great week. Catch you next time. And we're out. <laughs>